Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. Do want to continue the conversation going forward on the most intriguing teams in college football heading into the 2022 season. And what I can tell you is, it's not often that we do an audible in the middle of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. But obviously, I prep my notes, I do my homework, I whatever. And I did segment one. I obviously talked about Texas, USC, LSU, and Nebraska. And decided in between, rather than going straight into recording the second segment, let's go out for a bite to eat grab Mrs. T, we go out, get a bite to eat, and I see a guy at the restaurant that we're at, at the bar as a matter of fact, and he is decked head to toe in Oklahoma gear. Bigger guy, you know, kind of athletic looking guy. And I said, man, I bet that guy played ball. Just kind of looked like a guy that played ball, you know, at Oklahoma, definitely had the, the height, the weight, whatever. And so I go up to him, you know me, I'm Mr. Personable. And so I go up to him, and I say, hey, man, I hate to bother you, but uh, do you play ball at Oklahoma? I mean, you're literally Oklahoma shirt, Oklahoma shorts, uh, uh, crimson and cream sneakers. He says, yeah, man, I played about a few years ago. No big deal. And I said, interesting. So I'm in L.A., and I said to him, I said, well, what do you think of Lincoln Riley? You think he's going to do well here? And I can't believe this happened. I tweeted about it, but here's what happened at lunch, middle of the day, Sunday. Yes, yesterday, as I was getting ready to record this segment of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. Guy, Oklahoma, head to toe, in Los Angeles. I asked him about Lincoln Riley. Looks me dead in the eye. And people, if you have a child in the car, I encourage you to turn down the radio for the next 30 seconds. Because he looks me dead in the eye and he goes, Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley. Again, I'm giving you one more chance. Turn down that radio if you want to. Looks me dead in the eye. He goes, Lincoln Riley. I don't fuck with that guy. I don't fuck with that guy. That is why we are going to talk about Oklahoma in, this, in the midst of this most intriguing teams. Because I'll tell you this. I actually am very intrigued by Oklahoma. I didn't know if they fit into this segment. But talking to this guy who used to play at Oklahoma. He did not play for Lincoln Riley. He played in the, the old days with Bob Stoops. Brent Venables, the new head coach, ironically, was an assistant coach when he was there. Talking to this guy made me realize just how much vitriol there still is at Oklahoma for USC and how, in turn, Oklahoma is so interesting, not only to me, but to the college football world as a whole. Because I'll be honest. When Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma, you know, early December of last year, we all it was one of those, if you're a sports fan, you remember where you were when you found out that Lincoln Riley was leaving Oklahoma for USC. We just talked about it a minute ago. USC is one of those programs, when they get it rolling, they, are, they, they have the chance to compete as high as anybody. And we all wondered, would they ever get back there? And then Lincoln Riley leaves, and then you say, oh my God, USC is back. But when he left Oklahoma, something interesting happened, right? Because I think I would include myself among the many, many, many people who thought that when Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma, that it was all downhill from there. They're headed to the SEC. This guy doesn't think they can compete in the SEC. What are they going to do? All the players are going to leave and follow him to USC. And then what happened? Go to a bowl game. Dominate the bowl game. Hire Brent Venables. And yeah, a few guys left the program. Caleb Williams, Mario Williams followed Lincoln Riley to USC. Another cornerback named Latrell McCutcheon, may have mentioned him last segment, followed him to USC. But for the most part, everybody stayed. Now, we had other guys. Spencer Rattler probably wasn't going to play anyway. Leaves for South Carolina. Austin Stogner played for four years under Lincoln Riley, decides to leave. But for the most part, most of the guys that were there stayed. And what that said to me was two things, really. One, they believe in the new coaching staff led by Brent Venables. And two, they believe in Oklahoma, the brand, the program, even heading into the SEC. And so why Oklahoma is so interesting to me is for a couple reasons. And we talked about it last week on where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong. Again, I thought they were going to I don't want to say I thought they were going to fall off a cliff. 
I thought they would struggle under Brent Venables. Well, one, he's recruiting at an insane level. Oklahoma currently has the number six recruiting class in the country. But two, beyond that, I actually really like his team this year. Everybody focuses on who left, Caleb Williams, Spencer Rattler, this, that, the other thing. But here's who came in, and here's why I'm so intrigued. First of all, Lincoln Riley, you can criticize Lincoln Riley for whatever you want. To his credit, Lincoln Riley mostly left the cupboard full. 2021, their recruiting class was ranked number 10 in the country according to 24-7 sports. 2019, number 6 ranked recruiting class in 24-7 sports. 2020, number 13, which means that the three recruiting classes prior to Lincoln Riley's departure, three in the top 15, two in the top 10, Brent Venables inherited plenty. But why I give Oklahoma credit, why I give Brent Venables credit, and why I find Oklahoma intriguing is because of what Brent Venables has done since. First of all, I think everybody knows Brent Venables, uh, defensive coordinator at Clemson for many years, had previously coached at Oklahoma, had previously coached under Bob Stoops. So him being one of the elite defensive coordinators, if not the elite defensive coordinator in college football, you'd think that the defense is going to take a step up this year under Brent Venables. Where I give him credit, though, and why I'm so interested in Oklahoma, is because of the fact that he went out and he basically admitted, look, offense, that's not my side of the football. So what does he do? He goes out and hires Jeff Lebby, offensive coordinator from Ole Miss. Jeff Lebby was obviously coaching in the shadow of Lane Kiffin. He wants his own deal. Jeff Lebby comes in. He brings Dylan Gabriel, the transfer from Central Florida, who, oh, by the way, two years ago during COVID when he was healthy, 32 touchdowns, four interceptions. And so to me, Oklahoma's fascinating because I think everybody kind of has that mindset that I had in early January, mid-January, or early December, mid-December, maybe even late December of last year where I said, I don't know if this Venables guy is going to do it. I think people still have that mindset. You know how I said everybody's overvaluing USC right now? I think they're undervaluing Oklahoma right now. DraftKings Sportsbook, we love working with DraftKings. They have the Oklahoma over-under win total set at 9.5 for this year, which means that they think a good year for Oklahoma is 10-2 and and a down year is 8-4, and 9-3, and whatever. Well, I look at Oklahoma. I think the defense is going to be improved under Brent Venables. I don't think the offense is going to be nearly as bad as people think without Lincoln Riley because they brought in Jeff Levy. And so why Oklahoma is interesting to me, while I think USC might be the most overvalued team in the country, I think Oklahoma is the most undervalued team. Brent Venables kept that roster together. Defense is going to be better. Offense, I think, will be better than people give it credit for. And I'll tell you this. I don't want to spoil the rest of the, uh, the, the, the segments and shows that I'm going to do in August. But when I put together my preseason college football playoff field, Oklahoma is going to be in it. When I make my big uh, preseason conference picks, Oklahoma is going to be my Big 12 champ. I love Oklahoma. I'm intrigued by Oklahoma. And the one thing I'll say, we'll find out if Brent Venables is going to coach, can, can coach. But if he can't, if, if, if Oklahoma doesn't have success, it's not going to be for a lack of talent and for a lack of structure that he put into place. Love pretty much everything Brent Venables has done since he got there. Shout out to the guy that I met at the bar who basically says, I don't F with Lincoln Riley. Let's keep it going, and I want to get to number five, or number six, I guess it would be, in the most intriguing teams in college football this year. Number six, let's head back to the Big Ten. Just talked about Nebraska. Now it's time for... Da, 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 da. That's right, I'm talking hail to the victors, baby. I'm talking Michigan. I find Michigan to be fascinating. And I'll tell you full disclosure, I was going to talk Michigan State here, Uh, Michigan State is number nine. They got bumped out for Oklahoma. Michigan State's very interesting in their own right. But I think outside of Nebraska, in the Big Ten, the single most fascinating team in this conference is Michigan, and let me explain why. It's because if you had asked anybody the day the season ended last year, what Jim Harbaugh's approval rating would, would have been, it was the highest it's been literally since probably the day he was hired. Yes, they lost in the playoff to Georgia, but as we all know, Georgia was awesome, a historically great defense, and Michigan's coming off an incredible season, beat Ohio State for the first time in forever when Ohio State, you know, take out the year that they had an interim head coach, all that stuff. Beat Ohio State, win the Big Ten, go to the first ever college football playoff, and Jim Harbaugh's approval rating was through the freaking roof. And then since then, he's basically done everything wrong, okay? I've talked about it a lot, but it is worth reiterating here essentially like 10 seconds after the college football playoff finishes. 
like Jim Harbaugh shakes Kirby Smart's hand and starts walking back to the locker room, all of a sudden there's all these rumors about Jim Harbaugh going to the NFL. And here's the thing that we talked about on the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. Jim Harbaugh doesn't have an agent. So when those rumors leak, those are coming from either Jim Harbaugh himself or someone very, 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 very close to Jim Harbaugh. Rumors are the Raiders are interested. Well, do a quick Google search. Does not appear as though the Raiders were ever interested in Jim Harbaugh. Maybe the Chicago Bears. Chicago Bears never appeared to be very interested in Jim Harbaugh. That interview was done by Bill Polian, friend of the Aaron Torres podcast, and uh, yeah, did not appear as though Jim Harbaugh was ever a candidate. And so you kind of think, okay, he did his little NFL thing, going to come back to Michigan, no big deal. Then what does he do? We've talked about it a lot on this show. He goes and interviews with the Minnesota Vikings on National Signing Day in February. And so all of a sudden, your head coach goes and interviews on National Signing Day with the NFL in a job where I can't speak to other people, but all my sources told me he ain't getting that job. He might finish two, he might finish three, but they want Kevin O'Connell. They want the Rams' assistant coach. And so now he's got to come back to Michigan with his tail between his legs. And what I said at the time, and I still believe it, Jim Harbaugh, last January and February, he was basically like Lenny in Of Mice and Men. Remember Mice and Men, Of Mice and Men? Lenny, he's the big guy. He's got the little mouse in his pocket, and he loves the little mouse, and he loves the little mouse, and then something makes him mad, and he squeezes the little mouse, and the little mouse dies. That was basically Jim Harbaugh after the college football playoff. He's got this beautiful thing, his program, his alma mater. It's never been better. The Jim Harbaugh brand's never been hotter. Remember, he gave back part of his salary last year to the athletic department. Everybody loves Jim Harbaugh. He's got a higher approval rating than whoever has the highest approval. I don't know. It would have been Oprah back in the day. I don't know who has the highest approval rating now. He, his approval rating was through the roof. And then what does he do? He goes and interviews, and then this offseason has just been weird. Comes back, tail between his legs, doesn't get the Minnesota job, Minnesota Vikings job. Comes back, and what happens? Offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis leaves. Recruiting has been weird. Recruiting has been very weird. We've talked about it on this podcast. They had two elite quarterbacks in the state of Michigan. Lloyd Carr's grandson commits to Notre Dame. Okay, that one's a little weird. You know, he doesn't want to play in his grandfather's shadow, whatever. And then Dante Moore commits to Oregon. And of course, then it turns into, oh, it's NIL this, it's NIL that, blah, 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 blah. But I just bring it up to say that as I record here, Michigan has the 28th ranked recruiting class in the country. Michigan has zero top 100 players committed in the country. They're behind Stanford. They're behind TCU. They're behind Iowa. They're behind Northwestern. They're behind Washington. They're behind Louisville. This is Michigan we're talking about. And so why they're fascinating, I don't know what to make of Michigan. Now, I said it on the college football betting show. Credit to Harbaugh because they're basically 10 wins, nine, nine and a half wins automatic since he's gotten there. Basically, every year they win 9 to 10 games in the regular season. But you're coming off a scenario where you beat Ohio State, where everybody loves you. Now, coming into this year, you got questions. You lost a ton off your defense, including two first-round picks, Aiden Hutchinson, Dax Hill. David Ajabo, obviously, he had the unfortunate injury in the NFL draft uh, process, but that guy was basically an All-American. You had a veteran defense, now it's young. Last year was supposed to be the bridge year until you get to J.J. McCarthy, the freshman quarterback. He gets hurt in the spring. Now is he the guy? Is he not the guy? Do you go back to Cade McNamara? I think Michigan's good again, 10-2, 9-3. But Jim Harbaugh, he had the world in his hand, and he screwed it all up. That is why Michigan is number six on the most intriguing teams in college football list. Let's start to wrap up. Let's go back to the SEC. Or actually, let's... Yeah, let's go back to the SEC. We had LSU earlier in the show. You're talking about an interesting team to me. I would say Texas A&M is right up there. And why Texas A&M is up there, and we've talked about it on this show, on this podcast before, it's because I don't think there's a single program in college football where the dichotomy, the difference between what the fan base expects versus what the national audience expects is bigger. It's just a very interesting deal because college football is really interesting, right? 
college football, most places, the the internal fan base, the local fan base, their expectations are unrealistic relative to what everybody else nationally says. Most local fan bases, they want to go 12-0. and If they don't fire the coach, we're terrible. And most people on the outside are like, yeah, you're not that good. You shouldn't have those expectations. Texas A&M, I believe, is the exact opposite. Texas A&M, I think most fans, and I could be wrong, A&M fans, I know you listen to this show, tell me if I'm wrong. But I look at A&M, and what I see is a fan base where most people kind of admit, you know, we have three quarterbacks, none of which has really taken meaningful snaps for Texas A&M. Haynes King, who obviously was the starter last year, got hurt in the second game. Uh, Max Johnson transferred from LSU. Connor Wegman, the tra- uh, uh, freshman from the state of Texas, who probably isn't quite ready yet. So I think most Texas a and fans say, we don't really know who our quarterback is. And then on top of that, that freshman class that everybody's so excited about, they're super, super, super young. And most, fre- you know, you might have a star here or a star there, but to expect them to be major contributors on a meaningful team, it's probably a year away with AM. And so that's why AM is interesting to me. It's because I think most fans understand we're really building towards 2023. Now, 2022, we can't go four and eight. You can't go four and eight if you're Jimbo Fisher. But if you go nine and three and you have the right wins, I think most AM fans are going to be okay with it. Now, again, can't lose weird games. I don't know who that loss would be to. Um, you know, I'm just trying to uh, off the top of my head. I mean, obviously, AM is in a weird situation because their schedule is not easy. It's not super hard, but it's not easy either. They actually play Miami at home uh, during the out of conference portion of the schedule. They do have a crossover game with Florida in College Station as well as a trip to South Carolina. So I don't know exactly what the what the wins and losses are. But what I would say is, yeah, you can't go four and eight. And if you go nine and three or eight and four with a loss to App State or South Carolina or to whoever, you know, then there's cause for concern. But I think most people kind of understand we're a year away. But that's not how the outside feels. That's not how the outside feels. That's not how people outside of College Station feel. And that's why it's so interesting to me. What becomes of Texas A and M? I don't, they should start. 3 and 0, they play Miami at home in week 3. Then they go to play Arkansas in Dallas. That's of course a game that they lost last year. So that game is especially intriguing this coming season. But it is a weird deal where I I just think the expectations are a lot different internally versus externally, but that doesn't change anything. Again, we talked about Texas earlier. If A&M is 4 and 4 going into their last 4, you know, no one's going to be calling for Jimbo's head. But people are going to be saying he's overrated, a and is this, a and is that, so they're fascinating. Finally, last team I want to get to. I do want to talk, we haven't talked to any ACC, and I told you I wasn't going to talk Florida State in this segment. The Clemson Tigers are fascinating to me, intriguing to me, and here's why. Because I think we all look at Clemson from last year, and we all sit there and say, oh, what a disastrous season for Clemson. And like, I get it, right? I mean... The expectation at Clemson is pretty established at this point. It's to win the ACC, go to the college football playoff, compete for a national championship. Clemson did not do that last year. For people who forget, Pitt won the ACC. They went to the Fiesta Bowl. They played Michigan State. They lost, but they were the ACC champs. And so where it gets interesting with Clemson is we all look at last year as just this disastrous season. But it really wasn't. We forget it now, but they won 10 games last year. They went to the Cheez-It Bowl and destroyed Iowa State. Wake Forest, who had a, a who won their division, played Clemson late in the year. Clemson destroyed them. Clemson beat Florida State at Florida State. And so we look at Clemson as this complete abomination. They went 10-3. and three. Like, there are coaches in college football. We build statues for them if they go 10-3, and three, and we're ready to say that Dabo's lost his touch and he's totally out of touch and all that good stuff. And what was especially interesting about Clemson last year, it really was a perfect storm of kind of everything going wrong at the same time. They had just an astronomical number of injuries during the year. 
Will Shipley, the starting running back, missed a bunch of time. He comes back all of a sudden, the strangest thing happens. They have their leading rusher back. They start playing well again. Brian Brzee, obviously a, a potential first-round pick in this upcoming NFL draft. He gets hurt early in the year. He's out for the year. So you lose players to injuries. You lose players to transfer in the middle of the season. That probably doesn't happen if you're winning and everybody's happy. But more than anything, you just weren't good at the quarterback position. DJ Uyla steps in for Trevor Lawrence. 56% completion percentage, 9 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Not great at math. That ain't going to get the job done, though. Not if you're competing for a national championship. And so why Clemson's especially interesting, you can probably do the math. It's because if they get great quarterback play this year, they can compete for a championship. I don't think they're better than Alabama. But you, you, you step aside from Alabama? Ohio State's got big questions on defense. Georgia's got big questions on offense. Oklahoma has a new head coach. Utah is replacing most of its defense, defense excuse me, the defensive line, defensive front. Oregon has a first-year head coach. You get past Bama, just about everybody else has some major, major, major flaws, and Clemson can compete with all of them. That's if they get great quarterback play. What's especially interesting about the quarterback situation, though, is that never forget, last year they really had no options outside of DJ Uyla He was the guy that was supposed to be uh, uh, replacing Trevor Lawrence and this and that. And then a funny thing happened. He wasn't very good. They didn't have a backup plan. Well, this year, they got Cade Klubnick, five-star quarterback from the state of Texas. This year, they have an answer. This year, they have a backup. This year, they have an alternative if DJ Uyla does not work out. And so to me, why Clemson is fascinating is for two reasons. One, everything broke wrong for them last year. And if you listen to the college football betting show, you know darn well I'm a big believer that when that the, the, the breaks kind of even themselves out. And so you kind of do you kind of start looking at it. The breaks are probably gonna bounce Clemson's way this year. If they do, that's scary because they got basically no breaks last year. And then why it's especially interesting, if DJ Wilaganale does not work out, they got a backup that is ready to take his spot and potentially lead this team. And by the way, we know Dabo is not afraid to make a move at quarterback. Not sure if you remember how Trevor Lawrence got the starting spot, but uh, Kelly Bryan, who had led Clemson to a playoff the year before, four games in, gets benched. Trevor Lawrence takes over. 